horrific long bond auction, major rating agency downgrading the federal government's debt, deficits as far as the eye could see, no solution to them, a massive tail at the auction which signaled the end was near for treasuries. November 2023? No, this was August 2011. And by comparing these two horrific long bond auctions, it tells us something about what actually goes on with interest rates. Where do interest rates come from? The level of rates, how they behave, how they move. It's not what everyone says. It can't be. When you look back at these two auctions, it tells you what you really need to know about the interest rate environment. It's not supply. It's not the treasury. It's not the Fed. It's fundamentals. Let's go back to August of 2011 and review those fundamentals. This was August 5th of 20, 2011 when Standard & Poor's shocked the world. They came out and downgraded the U.S. government debt from AAA status for the first time ever. And everybody said, uh-oh, this is the end. What S&P said was every bit familiar to what we know today. The downgrade reflects our opinion that the plan the Congress and the administration recently agreed to falls short of what, in our view, would be necessary to stabilize the government's medium-term dynamics. The political brinksmanship of recent months highlights what we see as America's governance and policymaking becoming less stable, less effective, and less predictable than what we previously believed. Of course, that was absolutely true. Look at the trend in federal government debt before we even got to 2011. As of the second quarter of 2008, the government reported about $9.5 trillion of total outstanding debt. And then, of course, we got the stupid Bush helicopter, which wasted money trying to solve the Great Recession problem before it really got going. And of course, that did nothing. Then the Great Recession happened, which wasn't a recession, by the way. And the government responded to the Great Recession by Keynesian stimulus, the ARA bill, which meant more wasteful government spending. So even before we get to 2011, you can understand why people were upset. Here we have the government doing these stupid economist things that don't seem to have any effect. They don't work. I mean, the best they can say is they saved some jobs and they can't even really prove that. So the government is just throwing money at the economy and none of it's really producing any effect. So right from the beginning, it's understandable why people have this emotional reaction to the deficit, especially since not only did it not work, it didn't end. It continued through 2010 and into 2011. The economy wasn't recovering. The deficits were not stopping. By the time we get to the second quarter of 2011, the debt had grown to $14.3 trillion, more than 50% larger than just a couple years before. This was madness, something that we hadn't seen since World War II. So by the time we get to the auction on August 11th of 2011, Already the situation, is, as far as the deficit goes, was pretty grim. Treasury was selling $16 billion worth of 30-year long bonds, and this was the week after the S&P downgrade. On August 10th, the yield on the 30-year bond was 3.54%. On the next day, on August 11th, the day of the sale, yields were already rising, and it was 3.62% in the secondary market when the results came in from Treasury. What they showed was for that $16 billion long bond, the high rate was 375, a huge, huge tail, not just the one issue, but also the secondary market. We're talking 13 basis points above. More than that, 41.74% were allocated at the high yield, which meant that it seemed like investors were fleeing from the 30-year long bond, which seemed uh, pretty much consistent with the idea. The, by the end of the close on August 11th, the 30-year was yielding 3.82. That was a 28 basis point swing in the yield for one single day. November 2023 has got nothing on August 2011. And it wasn't just a 30-year bond. That awful bond, that horrific auction, got yields to go higher all up and down the curve. The 10-year yield, for example, rose 17 basis points on August 11th alone. And so the question naturally became... Who would want to own this worthless government debt, especially for 30 years? Thir the 30-year bond auction, lots of people said this was the canary in the coal mine. Suddenly, people were going to pay attention to these ridiculous, horrible government statistics, this ridiculous situation 
of the government deficit and continued government spending that didn't seem to end. Finally, the bond vigilantes were going to rise from their hibernation and put some sanity back into Washington. And it was going to start with this one auction that went way awry. That was surely the, f the shot heard around the bond market world. But of course, it wasn't. It wasn't even, the effect from that horrific auction didn't even last more than a single day. When you zoom out a little bit in the historical context for interest rates, what you see is that before we ever got to August 5th and August 11th of 2011, interest rates in general, treasury yields in particular, had already been going lower. From around February and March of 2011, they started moving lower, which was finally consistent with QE2. Remember, QE2 had begun the prior November. And originally, when QE2 began, interest rates rose, not fell, because QE has no impact on interest rates. Interest rates, that's another lesson we'll get into. Interest rates were moving lower. They moved up in the first half of QE2 and then down in the second half, which no correlation there. But interest rates were moving lower in 2011 before we got to this auction. But then late July of 2011, rates plunged. And in the middle of that plunge is when this auction took place. And what the reason why rates were going down so sharply, apart from that one, from that one day on August 11th, that's what, that's what you need to know about how all of these things work. Because it wasn't about treasury supply, it was about the background in growth and inflation. Because yields are fundamentally, as always, projections of growth and inflation expectations in the marketplace. It's not about treasury supply, nor is it about the Fed. It's about only that. And in 2011, growth and inflation expectations were taking a major hit, both in the short run, as well as what that short run would mean over the long run. Here's to give you a sample here. Let's go to an FOMC meeting in, in early August of 2011 to I mean, this is what the Fed was talking about as all of this auction stuff was taking place. Janet Yellen said, I've marked down my economic growth outlook substantially in light of the information received over recent weeks, which was not good. And I've become increasingly concerned about the downside risk. This is what they don't say in public, by the way. The latest data indicate that the U.S. economy has been running alarmingly close to stall speed over recent months. And I anticipate only a modest pickup in growth over the coming years. Her colleague, Eric Rosengren from Boston said, the memo from Vice Chairman Dudley highlights how much the deterioration in incoming data since the spring has increased the New York Fed's estimate of a probability of recession. Many private sector economists using similar models come to similar conclusions. With real GDP for the first two quarters of the year averaging less than 1%, it would get worse. It is not surprising that these models are predicting an elevated recession probability, even ignoring intangibles such as congressional dysfunction, European political dysfunction, and the first downgrade of the United States in recent history. The fundamentals of the economy mattered more than the downgrade. People were fleeing to these safe, liquid treasury bonds. Not, it does not about the characteristics, the credit characteristics of the federal government. It's about the perceived safety, and most of all, safety in liquidity. I cannot stress this enough of treasury bonds. And so you look at the trajectory of treasury bonds and treasury bond yields over this period, they fell through 2011, fell sharply through the middle of 2011, despite that horrific bond auction, and then stayed low for years, even though the fiscal situation didn't change. That's because the fundamental situation didn't change. And the fundamental situation, the poor economy, wasn't just driven by poor economy stuff. It was driven by Euro dollar shortages, global dollar problems. At the same time Yellen was talking about the trouble with U.S. Uh, incoming economic data and Rosengren was seconding Yellen's thoughts, here's what Brian Sack, the head of the open market desk, had to say about the monetary system right then. In terms of your question about reserves, I noted in the briefing, we are seeing funding pressures emerge. We're seeing a lot more discussion about the potential need for liquidity facilities, I mentioned in my briefing that the FX swap lines could be used, but we've seen discussions of TAF-type facilities in market write-ups, just like 2008. So the liquidity pressures are pretty substantial. And I think it's worth pointing out that this is all happening 
with 1.6 trillion of reserves in the system. As far as the public was concerned, the Federal Reserve had printed several trillion dollars in base money. As far as the monetary system was concerned, they knew those reserves were absolutely useless and worthless. Instead, we were experiencing a second major funding crisis in the euro dollar system, the US dollar global system that was causing retreat in the economy. It was short circuiting the recovery from the Great Recession before it even got going. Why do you think the Fed tried Q the second QE the year before? So the fundamentals in the bond market, money was becoming more and more deflationary. And furthermore, the second, the two QEs simply emphasized and re-emphasized how bank reserves don't matter. So the monetary system was breaking down. There were economic consequences of that breakdown. Growth and inflation expectations, short run and long run, were not good. Treasury was continuing to issue lots of bonds and there was lots of demand for those bonds because of these perceived growth and inflation expectations. So now we fast forward to November of 2023 and how similar are the circumstances? Fitch downgrades the US government. The treasury, the amount of debt being issued by the treasury department is biblical. It's epic. It's disgusting. It's huge. I mean, you understand. I mean, don't get me wrong here. I sympathize with people who are righteously upset about the government's deficit. There's every reason to be upset. I'm merely pointing out that this is how it works. Growth and inflation fundamentals are how interest rates get set. We don't have to like it, but we do have to realize this is the way it is. If we're looking for a way to solve the fiscal problems in the federal government, Bond vigilantism is never going to be it. There was a question about whether that was ever the case to begin with, but the bond market, as long as growth and inflation fundamentals are what they appear to be, and that's the overall lesson here, we're not going to have vigilantism. The federal government's debt, the federal government is going to be able to sell ridiculous amounts of debt because of putrid growth and inflation expectations. So we get to the November 9th, 2023, 30 year long bond auction that was described uniformly in the same terms as August 2011. Even though the August 2011 sale was far worse, it was horrific, it was horrendous, it was awful, all that stuff. Um, the government sold 24 billion in 30 year long bonds. The bid to cover was the lowest since December, 2021. Huge tale, which everybody talked about, just like 2011. The credit characteristics, I mean, think about it this way. We had 14 point some, 14.3 trillion in outstanding debt in the second quarter of 2011. By the time we get to the second quarter of 2023, the debt is now 32.3 trillion. And there was another trillion in debt added on top just in the third quarter alone. So massive amounts of new debt. Plus, they also think about this, the Federal Reserve, what short-term interest rates were this year versus where they had been in 2011. In 2011, short-term rates were zero or near zero. In 2023, short-term rates are up in the fives. And yet, Despite that explosion in deficit in between, despite the, the Federal Reserve short-term rates, pushing short-term rates up more than five points, the 30-year long bond today is barely a percentage more than it was 12 years ago. Think about that. 20 trillion thereabouts in additional debt, 500 basis points in short-term rates, and the 30 year long bond is basically where it was in 2010 before the slide into 2011. That is substantial, that's significant. That is, that is the earth shattering message that should be get, sent all over financial media, but instead we're focusing on treasury supply. Again, it's understandable why that's the case. The, the federal government's deficit is obscene. It's not helping, it's wasteful, it is wrong. Everything about it is bad, but that doesn't mean the treasury market is going to reflect those characteristics. The treasury market is instead looking at bigger problems. And those bigger problems go back to why the feds keep issuing so much debt to begin with. And those bigger problems are money, growth, and inflation. We have monetary system difficulties. It doesn't matter how many bank reserves the Federal Reserve creates. And the, the Treasury market, especially the long bond, the 30-year long bond, that should be worthless, instead has enough bids 
for rates to go down from where they were a couple weeks ago at that horrific auction. And they're not even that much higher than they were a dozen years ago, despite everything that's happened in between. Or this is the part here, because of everything that happened in between. Or more specifically, what didn't happen. We didn't see growth. We didn't see inflation, despite the fact that the federal government's debt, along with the Fed's QE policies, were supposed to bring about growth and inflation. And the markets were saying, we don't see it. We're, we would rather own a safe, liquid 30-year long bond, given these ridiculously awful credit characteristics, than to own something more risky that would be potentially susceptible to the awful growth and inflation that we see coming. And the market was right, absolutely right. And that was absolutely consistent with interest rate theory going back to Irving Fisher and Newt Witzel. We see interest rates go low and stay low during depressionary periods. That's what the market said. That's what actually happened. The Great Recession was not a recession. It was simply a contraction that began this depressionary period, as Emil calls it, the silent depression. So what are long bonds and all interest rates telling us in 2023? To begin with, they're saying the only reason they've gone up at all is because the Fed continues to push up short-term rates. But the market has been fighting that increase in short-term rates for these long-term fundamental reasons. And those are not just a recession, a high probability recession in 2023 and 2024, more importantly, how that recession in 2023 and 2024 will put us back onto a situation that where the 2020s look way too much like the 2010s. That's what interest rates are telling us right now. They're out of their September funk. They got away from this th horrific 30 year long bond auction. They want to go back down to where they were in the 2010s because outside of the overreaction to the pandemic a couple of years ago and its aftermath, Nothing has changed as far as long run growth and inflation potential. That's the markets telling us just as they were a dozen years ago. It's not about treasury supply. It's sure as hell not about the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve does not control interest rates. Growth and inflation do. And sadly, the markets continue to tell us that nothing has changed in that long run regard. You should realize that these 30 year long bond auctions tend to be volatile. These are not the only two examples. And that trying to make your case for the obscene deficit from treasury auctions, especially long bond auctions, that's not the way to go about it. Fundamentals matter here more than the obscenity that is Uncle Sam. The August 2011 long bond auction happened against the background of Eurodollar number two, the second Eurodollar cycle in the sequence. What are those? Check out the video link below me. As always, I thank you for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members and subscribers. And until next time, take care.